Hello, I'm Terry Cohan Link, principal of Linko. Welcome, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. We have people joining us from all over the world. Thank you for attending the webinar, Mitigating Climate Change Will Help Your Business Thrive with Terry Taminen, whom I will introduce in a few moments. This webinar is part of a series born out of insights shared by business leaders during conversations about the current and dynamically changing COVID-19 business climate. The conversations resulted in a timely white paper entitled Resilient Realism, which Linko recently published. This is my way of giving back and sharing relevant information I learned speaking with business leaders on a day-to-day -day basis as part of my ongoing executive search practice. These anonymously shared challenges, lessons learned, and opportunities identified are highlighted in the white paper. You can find a summary on my website where you can also request a full copy. In the wake of COVID-19, many of the respondents have been grappling with changing economics related to their assets, products, and services, remote workforces, new challenges of workflow and timetables, particularly now with the new wave of COVID-19, how to evaluate risks, work product, best practices to reassure clients and protect employees, protect assets and keep everyone safe, cybersecurity and privacy from offsite locations, how to lead remotely with loved ones sharing workspace and unanticipated demands on normal work time, the changing office environment to note but a few of the insights, disruptors, and challenges discussed in the white paper. Today's webinar focuses on mitigating climate change risks, why climate change is a critical risk factor, practical steps to mitigate risk, and steps to become a climate resilient business. The next webinar will be announced shortly. Please check my website and look out for an email invite. A little housekeeping. Thank you for the attendees who have shared their questions before the webinar. We already have a number in the queue. You may also send questions and comments in the Q&A box. And if not covered already, Terry will try to answer those during our session. So now let me introduce our speaker, Terry Taminen. And I'm going to, um, in a minute, switch over so you'll see him on the screen as well. He is president of Seventh Generation Advisors. From his youth in Australia to career experiences in Europe, Africa, China, and across the United States, Terry has developed expertise in business, farming, education, nonprofit, the environment, the arts, and government. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger appointed him secretary of the California Environmental Protection Agency and later cabinet secretary, the chief policy advisor to the governor, where Terry was the architect of many groundbreaking sustainability policies, including California's landmark Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006 and the Hydrogen Highway Network and the Million Solar Roofs Initiative. And it was during his uh, service uh, in, on, in the California state government that I originally met Terry. In 2010, Terry co-founded the R20 Regions of Climate Action, a new public-private partnership bringing together subnational governments, businesses, financial markets, NGOs, and academia to implement measurable, large-scale, low-carbon, and climate-resilient economic development projects that can simultaneously solve the climate crisis and build a sustainable global economy. He also provides advice through seventh generation advisors to Pegasus Capital Advisors the Green Climate Fund, and numerous global businesses on sustainability and green investing, as well as assisting governments and philanthropists with climate solutions, including Fiji, India, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, 
the Leonardo DiCaprio uh, Foundation. He's an accomplished author, and his books include Cracking the Carbon Code, The Keys to Sustainable Profits in the New Economy. In 2011, Terry was one of six finalists for the Zayed Future Energy Prize, and The Guardian ranked Terry number one in its top 50 people who can help save the planet. Now, let me transfer the presentation over to Terry. Just give me a second to do that. And Terry, I think you have to accept it now. Hello. Hello. I got to make sure uh, now that the camera's on that there's no spinach in my teeth. But uh, all things being equal, let's let's go ahead. Great. We have a series of questions, and we'll just get started. Please share with us some insights as to how Seventh Generation Advisors helps business organizations assess their climate risk and come up with an action plan that will be embraced by both employees and clients. Customers. Well, first of all, Terry, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you and and your uh, uh, colleagues here on this link. And I know it's going to be recorded, so hopefully it'll get shared far and wide, and hopefully we'll say something intelligent. Um, in terms of seventh generation advisors, uh, I created that when I left state government as a nonprofit to be able to help governments and companies, uh, nonprofits, and academics to address climate change, particularly through low carbon economic development, because we realize that charity can only go so far, uh, policy and, and mandates can only go so far. We really need to harness the financial institutions and the financial wealth that arguably got us into this problem in the first place, not intentionally, when oil was developed and internal combustion engines were developed and diesel fuel and so forth, coal, nobody was thinking to destroy the planet in the process. Uh, but now we know better, and now we know we have to make this transition. And so we need to harness that same force of capital for good that has now given us the Industrial Revolution and so much advancement and the opportunity to, to, to do better. So Seven Generation Advisors was founded as a nonprofit so that we could uh, raise funds from donors. Uh, you mentioned the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. They've been a generous supporter over the years, many other foundations, so that we could offer our services for free. That makes it a lot easier. There's no conflicts of interest when we're talking to a government or a business. We don't have any hidden agenda. And most importantly, we don't waste time going answering RFPs or competing with the Boston consulting groups of the world or the McKinsey's of the world. We can go in uh, where we can actually be effective based on our experience in government and philanthropy and in, uh, in climate change solutions. And I emphasize that point, and we'll do so throughout our conversation today. We've run out of time. Uh, scientists told us that by 2020, we would have to peak our global emissions and then start bringing them down at least 5 to 7% per year, every year thereafter. And clearly, we were not on a path to achieve that goal. Uh, greenhouse gases were continuing to rise, and the impacts continuing to be felt. So COVID, uh, maybe if there is a silver lining to it, has helped a little bit in the sense that industrial production and energy production have decreased. Um, greenhouse gas emissions were measured at one point to be about 17% lower than uh, before the, the lockdown and, and COVID. And that may have bought us a little more time on that 2020 deadline to peak our emissions. But the point is, we don't have a lot of time. And, uh, and that's why, again, being a nonprofit where we can go anywhere at any time to whoever really needs our help is, is, uh, is the way that we try to add value. And how do you go about reshaping a company's commitment to lowering greenhouse gas emissions and helping them to achieve net zero? Um, maybe you could give us a few actionable recommendations and also share some of the lessons you've learned in that process. Well, you couldn't have set it up better for me. A little self-serving uh, mention, you mentioned my book earlier. I'll, uh, I'll just actually show it, Cracking the Carbon Code, The Keys to Sustainable Profits in the New Economy with a nice foreword by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And although this was published in 2010, it um, uh, still holds true today. It's the recipe for a business to 
measure their products or services and the way they deliver them in terms of the carbon footprint, not as something like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I, I'm a sinner. I have to make up for my sins, but rather as a way of identifying inefficiencies in your process, which if you can take them out, will actually save you money and save your customers money. And in the book, I highlight several of those examples. Uh, Cisco Systems was one of the classics uh, about a decade ago who uh, wanted to re reduce their carbon footprint and realized that most of what Cisco Systems does is use energy. They have huge server farms that use enormous amounts of energy. And so they designed uh, servers, computer servers, web servers that were lower energy users and helped them save money not just from the energy that the servers use, but of course, air conditioning and so forth in the buildings where the servers are located. And all of a sudden they realized, oh, wait a minute, not only is that saving us money and reducing our carbon footprint, but if we sold those more energy efficient servers to our customers, they would do the same. So it's kind of like car companies selling more fuel efficient cars to consumers. And they developed a whole new line of business as a result. There's a lot of other examples uh, in the book and, um, and it's basically using carbon as a measure of your efficiency or inefficiency. And then it's amazing what you can find the, the deeper you dig. And, and that um, certainly is, it, we're going to talk about carbon throughout um, this hour. So um, that's, that's, that's a great lead in. Here's a question that came in from the audience. Um, it would seem that the government's first priority would be to make every building, home, commercial factory net zero energy by way of retrofit or as part of its construction. How do we accomplish this? Well, that's a, that's a great point and a great question. Um, buildings, of course, if you're going to do it, whether it's your home, whether it's an office building or a factory, every one of them is different and requires um, a special audit to identify what are the uses of energy that could be made more efficient or um, weather stripping and other kinds of uh, uh, preparation of the envelope of the building and so on. White roofs or cool roofs if you're in a hot climate, perhaps dark roofs if you're in a cold one, you want to absorb more of that heat from the sun. Um, and so a lot of both simple and complicated things, but they're very different for each building and for each age of building. Um, but when it comes to something like streetlights, and this is one of the things that we designed for uh, Rio de Janeiro and other jurisdictions around the world through the R20, we helped cities identify where they could retrofit their streetlights uh, because streetlights are kind of cookie cutter. There's you know three or four different types, there's different wattages, but uh, basically if a city inventories its streetlights, uh, you can very quickly then calculate what's the payback period for putting in LEDs, uh, more efficient ones, and the savings in terms of both energy and maintenance. And that can be done very quickly. So as, again, compared to needing um, energy audits per building for every single building. Uh, and so we have emphasized that model around the world and helped cities around the world to retrofit lighting um, in particular. And, and of course, it doesn't have to be just street lights from a city. It could be uh, Walmart, for example, has parking lots, giant parking lots that all are lit with very similar lights. And so a company like that could look at all of their exterior lighting, particularly in things like parking lots and, and the drop down lights on the sides of their large buildings and so on. And that would be much more cookie cutter, something that could be done uh, across their entire portfolio of buildings very quickly. Whereas, of course, if it's a, a larger facility and you're going to finance that retrofit, pay it back from the savings, uh, your investor, your bank might need an investment grade audit for the energy retrofit, and that can take much more time. Again, very worth doing, but, um, but a little bit more time consuming and challenging. One other challenge to doing that in buildings is, of course, very often the owner of whether it's commercial or residential real estate, uh, especially multifamily, um, is not the one who's occupying it and paying the energy bill. So there's not a lot of incentive for owners of buildings to make their buildings more energy efficient if they're not paying the bill. And so that's another area where government policy needs to step in and um, uh, do things like requiring the most energy efficiency retrofits, at least when a building changes hands, when money is changing hands anyway, and there's probably some remodeling going on that upgrades, uh, that would be the time to do it. Okay, those are a very helpful suggestions. Here's another question from the audience. 
What are your thoughts about moving to 100% use of electric or hydrogen-based vehicles? And how would we go about implementing a program that gets us there quickly? Well, uh, two things on that. Coincidentally, just today, Governor Gavin Newsom here in California yes. issued an executive order that requires all new cars in California that are sold uh, by 2035 be net zero. Doesn't mean they have to be electric, it means net zero, whatever that might mean given the technology at the time. And of course that doesn't outlaw internal combustion engines that may be in existence at the time, it's only new vehicles, but that's a big down payment since we turn over the fleet in California relatively quickly. Um, so, and that's of course a huge market signal since California is the world's largest car market uh, market signal to the car makers who are increasingly bringing electric vehicles to market um, and not just battery electric, but also hydrogen fuel cell electric and uh, and sends the message to the fuel providers, the charging stations, and of course the vehicle makers that they need to do this. Uh, Paris had uh, and some other cities in Europe have already announced a couple of years ago uh, deadlines by which they will only allow uh, zero emission vehicles in their cities. So that would even be uh, internal combustion engines, uh, trucks and such would be banned from coming into those cities uh, on certain deadlines. Typically, I think 2040, 2050 have been some of those deadlines a little further out. But, um, but again, it looks like a, a, a train that has left the station, uh, if I can mix metaphors, but uh, that is already looking to, to make this transition. And I think that's how you do it, is you have to send a market signal. You have to say, look, this is what we want in the same way that uh, government started by regulating fuel economy. And uh, we're now 90% uh, more uh, efficient in terms of emissions than we were when I was a kid. My, dad, uh, my dad's 1960 Chevy or whatever it was that he had. And we are uh, uh, many, many times more efficient in terms of fuel economy um, and, uh, and, and, as I mentioned, air emissions. So it uh, starts with government policy. That brings the technology along. And then, of course, you need the consumers to adapt the technology. And one more question from the audience. What will it take, in your opinion, that instead of providing resistance, public and private utility companies will provide leadership and the required investment capital, but the conversion of any type of fossil fuel energy source to 100% renewable, assuming a profound shift to energy storage as part of the upgrade. Can we get the utilities to do this with a carrot or with a stick? I think the utilities, much like the car companies, as we just discussed, are following the, the consumer preference, the regulatory preference, uh, and already moving in that direction. But I'm also sympathetic to their concerns that they built out uh, a certain amount of power plants and transmission uh, under the assumption they would have a certain number of years to amortize those investments. And if people suddenly stop using those because they've put solar on a rooftop or over a large parking lot at a Walmart, for example, uh, and then suddenly want the utility to take that energy and mix it with grid energy, uh, and of course, it comes and goes depending on the time of day. Uh, and then uh, and maybe they want to even get off the grid altogether and leave stranded assets of, uh, of the utility sitting there that haven't been paid off yet. I can certainly understand why utilities and why in California, for example, the independent system operator that has to mix all of the different uh, sources of electricity with the demand why they would say, hold on, hold on, and why they want to take it a little more slowly than many advocates do. So I think part of the secret is to get these utilities to the table and map this out together. It's the same thing as your last question with, uh, with, with clean vehicles. We, uh, we knew that people could plug in a battery car and that battery cars were already in existence 10, 15, 20 years ago. But we also knew that hydrogen electric was a real uh, valuable asset because it doesn't take hours of charging. You can fill up a, a tank of hydrogen in a few minutes, much like a tank of gasoline, and then the hydrogen is converted to electricity on board the vehicle. So it's still an electric vehicle, but there were no stations. So the car companies didn't want to deliver cars if they didn't have enough hydrogen fueling stations. And of course, uh, the, the stations uh, didn't want to uh, build the stations if there were no cars. So we formed the Hydrogen Highway Network in the Schwarzenegger administration and got 200 stakeholders together, the fuel companies, consumers, car companies, 
We also thought about the insurance companies, the fire marshals that have to permit the creation of hydrogen stations and uh, other safety officials that have to permit the hydrogen vehicles with compressed gas uh, going across a bridge, for example. You don't think of all of this right away with new technology. But that was how we got everyone together and got them all on the same page, literally and figuratively, about the rollout simultaneously of new hydrogen stations and more vehicles. And that's why today in California, we have uh, uh, close to 100 stations and uh, several thousand, 10,000 vehicles. And now it's really starting to take off uh, and it's spreading to other states. So, uh, so I think that's really a model for the same thing with, uh, with moving toward 100% renewables or at least uh, zero net emissions is we've got to have all the parties at the table and understand their legitimate concerns and then map those out and come up with a joint plan. So seventh generation advisors, um, were, you were instrumental in designing a roadmap for reducing carbon pollution using carbon markets. <clears throat> Pardon me. And in particular, you worked on an agreement between California and China. Would you explain how, given the current U.S. political tension with China, you're advising parties to the agreement to engage constructively towards this goal? You know, the nice thing is that people who really care about certain issues um, continue to get along even sometimes when their governments don't. And uh, certainly here in California, our state government has been uh, at the opposite side of some of these issues when President Bush was in office and certainly now that President Trump is in office. Um, but we keep moving forward, as do other states and as do other provinces in Canada. So we created a cap and trade system, much like the European system, where we put a cap on, on emissions and uh, uh, companies that are required to uh, reduce their emissions to get below those levels year by year, they can either add the technology to their smokestacks or their processes and, and actually literally reduce their emissions, or they can buy offsets in a trade, so the cap and trade, where they can buy offsets from somebody else who reduced their demand faster than was required. So, um, uh, and that system has worked. I mean, there's certainly been bumps in the road in getting it started uh, and, and uh, uh, there's been concern about fraud in some cases about what the offsets are actually accomplishing and those types of things. But uh, as with any new system, you iron out the bugs. Um, I often point out to people that even after decades uh, of having a stock market, we continue to have some people that manipulate the stock market and do illegal things. So no system is perfect. But um, I think the unbalance, the greenhouse gas marketplace here in California has helped companies achieve their reductions in the most cost effective manner possible. So if you have, let's say, an older factory that you're planning on demolishing or upgrading in five years, you don't want to spend a lot of money putting control technology on the machinery and the smokestacks um, when maybe for four or five years, you could just buy uh, offsets from someone else who reduced faster than they had to. Um, on the other hand, you know, you might uh, say, wow, I think I can get well below the cap and even turn my efficiencies into a source of revenue. I'm going to reduce my emissions farther and faster than I have to, and then generate a credit, which I can sell and turn that into a source of revenue. Again, I'll shamelessly plug my book, Cracking the Carbon Code, which uh, describes all of this. Um, it can even become a new source of revenue for businesses. So we not only have done this in California and linking with some Canadian provinces, but we're now talking with China. They now have been experimenting with similar localized subnational uh, regional cap and trade systems, and this year are taking it all the way national. And uh, you know, bigger markets tend to be more efficient. They tend to have more com competition, which brings down the cost of compliance. So our goal is to uh, map out how we could link the China system with the California Canadian system, and then ultimately with the European system. And in the United States, some people might be surprised to know there's another cap and trade system with 10 states in the Northeast, including New York and New Jersey and such, called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, that only regulates uh, the power industry and only CO2, whereas these other trading systems regulate all six primary greenhouse gases and most all industries. 
Um, so we would want to then get Reggie to kind of come up to the level that the rest of us are at, link all of those systems into one big market by 2025, and you'd have about half the world's economy with a price on carbon that would help uh, drive down emissions much quicker than regulation or waiting for innovation alone. How, how many economies in the world, how many nations are part of the system currently, approximately? Uh, yeah, I mean, so as I mentioned, um, California, which should be its own country, we're the fifth largest <laughs> economy on the planet, uh, and Quebec in Canada are in one system. Reggie has uh, 10 states in the Northeast, which represent a big part of our economy in the East, uh, and then China, uh, and then uh, uh, Europe, the entire European Union. Uh, so all, is it 27 countries there, I think, are all participating in one uh, carbon market system. Uh, there's some smaller experimental ones in different places, but those are the main ones. Okay. In a recently published white paper from McKinsey entitled Climate Math, What a 1.5 Degree Pathway Would Take, the author suggests there is an imminent risk to the U.S. financial system, which we have referred to in this conversation um, uh, during, during this last half an hour, and um, from climate change. And if we do not immediately begin taking actions to reduce greenhouse gas, what specific examples can you share from your work helping to prepare and defend our financial systems from this risk? Well, I'd say the bigger risk is not moving to a low carbon economy because, um, you know, just in the last five years, and you mentioned this um, when you were making your introduction, I think there's been this great volatility in the price of oil uh, in the last five years. It's been $150 a barrel. And then just a few months ago, it was negative uh, $5 a barrel. They were paying you to take it and, uh, and everything in between. And I have to tell you, as a regulator in, uh, in California, the one thing that businesses would always say to me when they would come to talk about a new tax or fee or regulation, they'd say, look, we don't like any of that stuff. But obviously, if we're going to have it, give us time to adapt, let it you know, build in slowly so we can adjust our, our business plans and so on. Because the number one thing that hurts our businesses is uncertainty. We need certainty. Well, there's nothing more uncertain than the variable price of oil which uh, how many businesses are entirely dependent on that to get their products to market, of course, or in the case of, say, airlines, uh, shipping industry and so forth are entirely dependent on fuels. Uh, and then, of course, the same thing is true with coal and other fossil fuels uh, that, are, that are completely uh, unreliable in many ways or with a growing uh, demand by the world to put a price on carbon. It, it, uh, it risks all of that. And then you see, you know, circumstances with some of the big oil companies who um, are showing on their books that they have large assets in uh, undeveloped oil. Well, if nobody wants that oil, those assets aren't really worth as much as are, they're carrying on the books. And at some point, those companies will be devalued and you'll be stuck holding a stock you thought was worth X and it'll be worth X minus 50%. So, um, so I think there's a much greater uh, risk from not embracing the future and moving in this direction to the to the world economy and the U.S. economy, um, and you know we also risk being left behind. And this is something that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and I went to meet with Donald Trump right after he was elected. We hoped that we could convince him that good environmental policy was consistent with good economic policy when it came to things like putting solar panels on rooftops. That, of American houses. That's something you can't export to another country. Uh, to energy efficiency, we talked to him about, for example, the re retrofitting of old street lights in American cities that could be done with a Department of Energy loan guarantee program. So harness the private sector, but have government lead the way. He loved all of those ideas, but then of course never embraced them in his in his uh, administration. But it shows that uh, that even Trump and his group understood the benefits of, of efficiency. Um, and of leading the way because American technology for so long has been what everybody else wants to buy. It's been the leading technology. And here again, thanks to Tesla, you could argue that we are the leaders in electric car technology. But if the other big automakers don't come along and do the same thing, 
we're not going to be leaders for very long. Everyone else is going to be doing what happened after the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s. They're going to be buying Japanese or Korean or Chinese cars because they're more efficient and, uh, and, and much newer technology. And America will be left behind. Its manufacturing industry will be left behind. So, uh, so I think we've got plenty of examples of where not embracing this future is going to hurt us much more than embracing it. And 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 as as a segue to your 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 comments just now, what type of regulatory environment will it take to achieve these changes we've been discussing? You know, it's not regulation alone. I often say it's a three-legged stool. It's policy, technology, and finance. So, you know, when we set a goal in California in the Schwarzenegger administration for a percentage of our electricity to come from renewables by a certain date, that sent the message to all the utilities and all of the, the energy providers that you now know this is what you're going to have to meet and here's an opportunity. So then sure enough, all kinds of new solar and wind projects and energy efficiency projects came online and the utilities, all they had to do was issue requests for proposals and they got plenty of them. And that really stimulated an entire new industry. And by the way, it helped us through the last recession. California weathered the last recession much better because much of our construction industry that was hammered the same way the rest of the U.S. construction industry was, was hurt, uh, was saved because of roofers and electricians and laborers uh, building out uh, solar infrastructure and wind infrastructure throughout the state. Um, so, so it started with, in that case, uh, a government mandate or a regulation. The same thing I think is true with our building efficiency standards. Um, and one of the things that we have to do as regulators, and I had to do, we had um, AB 1493 was passed in, in the year 2001, I think it was, which set greenhouse gas limits on tailpipe uh, emissions. And uh, by 2005, as it turned out when I was EPA secretary, um, we had to certify that the requirements from the Air Resources Board for those emission uh, reductions were technologically feasible. I mean, you can't mandate something that can't be done and economically feasible. So we had to do the studies to prove that getting to a certain lower level of greenhouse gas emissions in cars was technologically and economically viable. So when regulation happens, that's one of the things that is always required. And uh, uh, of course, the affected industries will argue it's not that it costs nothing. We're not saying that it does cost something. But for example, in the case of cars, the car owner recouped the extra cost of equipment on the car at the time of purchase or leasing from lower operating costs, cheaper fuel, and so on. So I think it starts with enlightened policy, then technology has to catch up, or it's a bit of a chicken or the egg where the technology tells us what's possible that allows us to push the regulation, um, and then finance. Because ultimately, if consumers don't buy the product or if investors don't invest in the companies to deliver these products, uh, we ultimately won't succeed. So it really does take a nice balance between policy, technology, and finance. But in many cases, it starts with the policy. And, and following up on that, what is your message to finance companies who are interested in newer technologies that embrace lowering greenhouse gases, improving water quality, etc. Yet when push comes to shove, they tend to be very, very conservative and hesitant to really jump in and own it. How do you help them overcome their legitimate and traditional conservative approach to funding? Well, I think the, the answer really is in the, the sense that, uh, as you said, you have to kind of understand what are the dynamics they're living with. And today, so many companies, whether it's investment firms or technology companies or retail, whatever, everybody is managing to the stock price, uh, especially in these troubling times. They're, they're, they're always looking at the stock price on the quarterly report. What is the quarterly report going to say? They're not thinking long term. And I think if more companies uh, did what some of the leadership few do, 
um, and certainly a lot of private companies that aren't quite as as driven by their stock price, um, that if they looked long term and thought short term and long term, um, they would do so much better. And there's plenty of examples of that. I was advising a, a German company called Henkel, which uh, is kind of a Procter and Gamble uh, of Europe. They make uh, uh, laundry detergent and and knives and all kinds of other household products and and uh, uh, cleansers and and supplies, and it's a family company that has existed for 200 years, and they have family members still running the company and sons and daughters coming up into the company. They realize they won't have products to sell in a few decades if they continue to just uh, use up all the water or pollute it. If they continue to use up all of the natural resources and uh, and destroy the planet there won't be anything left to make their products from and therefore to be able to stay in business. Um, so when I was working with them, it was such a pleasure to hear that sense of generational obligation, but also opportunity that, uh, that they knew they needed to keep their supply chains open um, for the long term, not just whatever was going to help them sell something faster, better, cheaper for the next quarter. So I always try to use examples like that to help companies understand that, all right, look, we understand you got to make a profit now, you got to keep your employees operating now, and you've got to serve your customers now. But um, you do have an obligation to the company and to the future to at least give some thought to where all of this is headed. And it's one of the pieces of advice, you know, I wrote another book called Lives Per Gallon, The True Cost of Our Oil Addiction, where I'm very hard on the oil companies for them having lied to the public and regulators, much like tobacco companies did, uh, getting caught and, um, and, and having to, to do a number of things in retribution. But, uh, but more importantly, what I say in that book is I'm not trying to put them out of business. I'm trying to civilize them so they have a business. Uh, if they just keep uh, trying to sell fossil fuels, they're going to become like Kodak, which couldn't see digital photography coming and dominate that, uh, or taxi companies that weren't smart enough to, to create an Uber type app um, and be more serving to their customers. And, and the list goes on and on of all the disruptive technologies, Amazon with retail and so on, that you know, if you don't learn from those examples, then you know, your company and your shareholders are the ones that are going to suffer the most. Uh, when you don't have products that you can sell to this new wave of consumers and, and that meets the new demand. This month, the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission Subcommittee on Climate-Related Market Chain a Risk came out with a white paper managing climate risk in the U.S. financial system. In your opinion, what's the significance of this for how financial institutions, businesses in the U.S. will address climate risks going forward? I think the biggest lessons from that and from much of what we're seeing in the news every day is that we can no longer mitigate all of climate change and, and its impacts. We're going to have to adapt. Um, that you know, We're already seeing the massive, uh, unprecedented forest fires in the West. Um, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, unprecedented levels and intensity of storms in the Gulf Coast and on the East Coast. Uh, droughts, epic droughts that last longer than ever, uh, have an impact on our food supply. Changes in climate that uh, bring pests from different places, disease, and so on. And so I think when institutions like that are looking at climate risk, they're they're looking at what these impacts are going to be. Um, you know, we saw, for example, two years ago when Paradise, the town of Paradise in Northern California, literally burned to the ground. Um, there was a uh, an insurance company there. I think it was called Merced Insurance that went out of business because they there's no way an insurance company can imagine that all of their customers are going to get wiped out at once. And it didn't have a very diverse portfolio of customers. It was based in that community, which I'm sure people in the community thought highly of having a, a local insurance company until they didn't have the assets to pay off the claims. And that's a, a good warning to everybody else. In Florida, for example, uh, my sister lives in Jacksonville Beach, and for some years she couldn't get homeowner's insurance living near the beach uh, because of the climate risks. And uh, so the state had to step in and provide a pooled insurance that the state provides now for local businesses and homeowners that are near the coast because of sea level rise and more intense storms. And that means all taxpayers are paying for that. 
Uh, it's much like earthquake insurance here in California, which of course has always been government sponsored because that's nothing that most insurance companies could handle. But we could have gotten in front of climate change and this didn't have to happen in Florida. Um, and so, you know, again, that's where the dangers are is that it overwhelms even public resources and you're seeing that happening now with uh, there's not enough money to deal with the fires and the implications of cleaning up, whether that's the, the government or whether that's insurance and, and uh, private individuals. Uh, the same thing is happening with storm after storm. There was a NASA satellite photo that I think captured this brilliantly the other day. It showed two big swirling storms in the Gulf of Mexico headed toward the United States. And then if you looked above where those storms were rotating, you saw the smoke from the fires in the West coming across the entire United States. So there was this haze across the upper part of the, of the continent and these unprecedented storms in the lower part. And it just shows you what, what was predicted decades ago and what we could have avoided uh, and made ourselves much more profitable and secure in the process, what we could have avoided had we paid attention earlier. But it's now too late to do just that, to just continue to, to mitigate. We're going to have to put money into adaptation. And sadly, there's not really a lot of ways to make a profit on that as there is with mitigation. And so that's going to come from taxpayers. And I think we're going to have to see our taxes go up and, uh, and even things like, for example, the example I gave of uh, 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 coastal real estate insurance in Florida my sister has uh, worse coverage at a higher cost being in the state pool, much like the earthquake insurance here is nothing to write home about. It's better than nothing, but you can't get private earthquake insurance. Um, and so it's the same thing here that if a disaster happens, you're, you're, you're going to be sad. Yeah. Okay. Following up in the same um, article from the, um, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, it, they recommend that a national price on carbon should be set by Congress. Is this achievable? And if so, when and what will it take to accomplish this goal? Well, I do think, you know, as I mentioned before, I think the cap and trade system is the way to do it. I think uh, uh, we already have examples in California and 11 or 10 uh, northeastern states. So there's already a precedent. Uh, taxes obviously are politically toxic. So I don't think a carbon tax is going to work per se. Um, I think the way to get a price on carbon is with this market-based approach, which allows the regulated industries to find the cheapest way to comply and to get down even faster. It also provides a cap. So we know year by year, how much are we reducing greenhouse gases by using the cap and trade? If you put a tax on, if you have even a dollar a gallon extra tax on, on gasoline, for example, how much will that change people's driving habits? Or do they grumble pay the extra cost and then just don't eat out as often or go to the movies, which nowadays we're not doing anyway. Um, and so we, we don't know what the outcome of a climate of a carbon tax would be. And we've run out of time to experiment. Uh, and my guess is that, you know, if you look at gasoline in Europe where it's $8 a gallon, they find ways to get around. Um, and the tax itself hasn't reduced uh, consumption enough to meet their climate goals. It's helped because it's very expensive. But, um, but they also lower taxes on other things. And there have been a number of proposals like that in Congress when you ask about how can it get done here. Well, first of all, as I mentioned, the cap and trade system already exists. So expanding that would be one way to do it. Um, there's a, a number of uh, proposals to have a, a carbon tax, which as I said, I'm not in favor of, but, um, but where that would be offset by a reduction in employment taxes. Um, and uh, so it would be a net zero tax to the consumer, but it would change behavior because you'd be paying more for fossil fuel or energy or fuels and uh, less for, uh, for labor in essence. Um, and there's also some proposals that would have a cap and dividend where you would cap emissions, you would charge the emitters a fee for their pollution, and then you would return that money to the citizens. So every, everyone would get a check at the end of the year. And that seems attractive to some, the idea that they get free money, so to speak, and especially if they live in energy efficient homes or apartments, drive energy efficient cars, they really get a benefit because they get the same as people that would live in more uh, energy using facilities. But, um, uh, but the problem with that is those who have proposed it have said they would only support that if we wipe out all 
other climate regulation, cap and trade systems, et cetera, that are in existence today and have taken a long time to get into place and to yield results, especially in states. So I don't think we can afford to abandon what's working while we're trying to add something to get us the rest of the way. I think we've got to do both. What, how will this impact, let's, assuming we get to whether it's through a, a, a cap and trade that's embraced um, uh, on a federal level or it's setting a, a national price, how is that going to impact business insurance? How are the insurance companies going to deal with this? You know, I don't know that a price on carbon impacts uh, insurance companies all that much. Um, I think in general, anything that addresses climate change, both on the mitigation and the adaptation, is going to help insurance uh, uh, costs, the, the premiums, come down. Um, it's interesting that in the early or mid-90s, I was uh, executive director of Environment Now, which is a foundation here in Los Angeles that works on environmental issues, as the name implies. And we were starting to look at climate change issues back then. And uh, the, uh, the efforts were already being made by insurance companies. Uh, they were offering, they were putting some of their staff on loan to like the, the Climate Group and Carbon Disclosure Project and other nonprofits to learn about climate change and mitigation activities and policies and so forth to, to help these startup nonprofits, but also to learn and bring that information back into the insurance industry. Swiss Re was one of the early leaders in that and uh, continues to be a, a leader in the insurance industry in these issues. Um, and so I think the insurance industry has long realized what the risks are and the costs are, which of course they pass on to their consumers. Uh, another example, when I was EPA secretary, I visited London and the environment secretary for, for the UK um, showed me a plan that they had put together in the 1990s. This was now in the mid 2000s. Um, and uh, uh, they had put that together in partnership with the insurance companies because the insurance companies were refusing to insure a lot of real estate around London because of sea level rise, more intense storms uh, in the North Sea and flooding from the Thames River. And so they were starting to reject even insuring many of those places. And so working with the government, they came up with four billion pounds worth of uh, improvements to make. That included those big tide gates on the on the opening of the Thames River to, to handle unprecedented storm surges at times, uh, also bringing electric uh, utilities from underground to above ground so that flooding wouldn't impact them as much. So they invested four billion pounds in, in, in collaboration with the insurance industry, and that averted over 80 billion pounds of expected damages. And then the insurance companies, with these new measures in place, went right back into the city of London and started issuing policies again. Competition brought down the cost of premiums. And uh, unlike Florida, government didn't have to provide the insurance in lieu of the industry. So it helped the consumers, it helped the industry, uh, and it certainly helped the country. Switching a little bit to a different, uh, a little bit of a different topic, question from the audience. Agriculture is responsible for 80 to 90% of US water consumption. Growing feed stock, uh, crops for livestock consumes about 56% of water in the US. How is your company working to ensure fresh water sources remain clean and available for drinking use and what technology are you supported, supporting and excited about? Uh, it's a very good point about how much water agriculture uses and how even say a 5% efficiency gain would be more than a 50% efficiency gain coming from urban users uh, just because there's so much that's used there. And, and more and more agriculture is going to micro leveling and, and you know micro drip irrigation and things like that. Um, but part of the problem is that especially in places like the West and California and other Western states, uh, water has been subsidized for so long by states and the federal government, the federal water project and such, that it doesn't have a real price. It's not like energy where you're paying the real price, the real cost for it. And so uh, there's not a lot of incentive for some of the large agribusinesses to conserve. So one of the things is certainly using technology, first of all, raising the price to what it really costs in whatever jurisdiction you're in. And, uh, and then using uh, that to 
uh, harness some of these technologies that can do microclimates. There's large orchards here in California, for example, where sensors are used throughout the orchard to, to understand the microclimates. You don't need as much uh, water or as much pesticide or as much of this or that in this five acres as you do in this 10 acres over here and so forth. And constantly adjusting uh, those inputs has saved a lot of money and pollution um, and made it much more efficient to grow various kinds of crops, especially high value crops, the nut crops and so forth. Um, and uh, um, I think the other thing that we're doing, what we work on in particular is less related to agriculture, but more related to urban demand. And of course, it's a zero sum game. If, if urban and industrial users are taking the water out of the system, that's less for farmers. Um, we work a lot on stormwater capture and treatment because we've designed systems, especially here in California, to, to efficiently take the stormwater and throw it away uh, to get it out of our landscapes and dump it in the ocean or dump it in rivers. And we now realize, wait a minute, that's a resource we should be trying to harness. And there's many really exciting cost-efficient ways to do that. We feature them on our website, seventhgenerationadvisors.org. Seventh and um, uh, there's a whole toolkit there for municipalities that want to try to conserve on water using resources they have. For example, in Sun Valley, which is a small industrial and residential area in northern Los Angeles County, they remodeled an old dilapidated city park. They tore up the park. They put in cisterns, Roman technology, thousands of years old, just basically a giant cinder blocks underneath the park, um, put the park back on top, so a nice new park. And those cisterns fill up with flood water every year when it rains. And, uh, and then much of it percolates back into the aquifer, but some of it that's in the cisterns can be used for the city or even sold to neighboring cities. So they more than paid for the park and uh, upgrade to the, to the city um, and, and co now collect all the water that they need instead of having to buy it from Northern California and ship it down our aquifers at great energy expense and, and other expense. Uh, getting to Southern California. So there's simple examples like that where, where you can uh, pay for it and uh, get more and more of the users uh, to be more self-sufficient, taking a watershed approach, using what's in the watershed in your given region. And then that does free up more water for agricultural uses, but it still is important for agriculture to use modern technology to be more efficient. And as a follow-up to that question, um, with regard to wastewater policies, your thoughts about improving secondary and tertiary wastewater treatment plants? Well, I think one of the biggest opportunities is waste in general. Um, and uh, I think it's an area that we, we don't totally understand. You know, it's out of sight, out of mind. And yet entire forests are going through our hands every day and being dumped into landfills. Uh, oil wells, and we go around the world to, uh, to to secure the next barrel of oil. But meanwhile, we're throwing away barrels of oil every day in the form of waste plastic, um, metals, glass, etc. The list goes on and on. And one of the biggest wastes that you can't reduce, all of those other wastes you might reduce by reducing packaging or making things more efficient, but you can't reduce human waste and uh, therefore waste water. Uh, and so one of the things to do there is uh, to use modern pyrolysis and other technologies to utilize that and turn it into uh, uh, gases that can be productively used, turned into low carbon fuels or, uh, or uh, fertilizers uh, uh, and, and other kinds of, of products. Uh, the same thing with waste tires. Tires are another thing you can't really reduce the amount that you're using. And, uh, and so far, almost all of them are just dumped in landfills, which uh, the tires fill up with water. They have mosquitoes, which breed Zika and all kinds of other diseases. They have uncontrolled fires. Uh, some get turned into what's called crumb rubber and used for, uh, you know, uh, gym mats and, and uh, playground surfaces and even put into our road beds now to make the, the roads more comfortable to drive on. But uh, the vast majority don't get recycled. And they could be. They could be broken back down into black, carbon black, which make new tires and uh, and or fuels. So I'm, I'm excited about modern technology that can actually make use of 90% of what we today throw away in landfills or out of those uh, sewage pipes. Mm -hmm. 
another, we're coming towards the end of our hour and I want to ask you one more question and then a, a general question before we begin to close off. This is another question from the audience. What other actions should we implement immediately to fully address climate change by 2030, if not sooner? Well, I really appreciate the emphasis on 2030 because a lot of climate models have shown us what we have to do by 2050. But if we don't make enough of a down payment in the next 10 years on those 2050 goals, it almost won't matter because the planetary forces will take over and uh, we won't be in charge of our destiny anymore, which was where we were talking about earlier about peaking emissions by this year or next year and then starting to bring them down. So I think the sense of urgency is the first thing, whether you're in business, whether you're just talking to friends and relatives, um, uh, your own personal life, if there's things that you're doing that uh, every little bit will help and will matter. You might be an example to others, even if you know what you're doing is a, is a small thing. And there's a lot of small things that add up to a lot. We have a, uh, a personal action hub climate center on our website at sevengenerationadvisors.org where you can lower your carbon footprint 20% in 20 days, and you can do even a lot more. And uh, so there's a lot of simple tips there, but I think we all have to become evangelists and use every interaction, every conversation to make people more aware of the consequences of inaction and what everyone individually, as a business, as in policy and in general life, that each of us can be doing. Thank you. So finally, I want to ask you a question about you, Terry. Uh, how is it going with your diet goals during the quarantine? And tell us about your new biodiesel boat. Well, um, the boat's a simple one. It's an old Bayliner, a 25-year-old boat, so I believe in recycling. And uh, we're running it on biodiesel. So uh, uh, it's uh, we're trying to be as energy efficient and uh, fuel economy efficient as we can be and, and uh, climate sensitive as we can be. The diet is something, you know, I often say to people, as I mentioned just before, that we can all do more individually. And um, in the last 10 years, the average American has gained 10 pounds, myself included, and now even more so during COVID when we're all stuck at home. And, uh, and that has resulted in airlines flying across the country, pre-COVID, of course, but flying across the country, burning 350 million more gallons of jet fuel because of all that extra weight that Americans have, have added. So uh, if we all lost that 10 pounds, we'd feel better, and so would the planet. Uh, so, uh, so I'm committed to getting rid of not only the 10 pounds I gained, but however many more during COVID, uh, not only as a way for me to feel better, but uh, but the planet too. Thank you for that. I'm going to change back now over um, to my picture so that I can properly thank you and our audience. And one second, there we go. Terry, I want to thank you so much for generously sharing your time and expertise to address these critical and timely issues related to climate change and solutions to financial and business risk. A summary of this webinar, along with the recording link to my YouTube channel, will be shortly posted on my website. Linko Executive Search provides elite companies with top CXOs and upper management across industries nationwide using a proprietary step-by-step -step process for both clients and candidates. We are on 24-7, 365. When you need help, please call upon us. The next webinar will be posted on my website shortly. When posted, please reserve your seat and stay tuned for additional topics and speakers. And do let me know what topics would be of use for your business sector. The webinar registration links can be found via my website, www.linko.net, and in the events section of my Linko LinkedIn page. Have a good day and stay safe. And thank you again. <laughs>